Linda Moulton Howe. Hey, thanks, Whitley. It was a year and a half ago I received an email from a retired 60-year-old U.S. Navy Petty Officer, First Class Flight Engineer. He asked me to only call him Brian to protect him because he works in an aerospace company today. He entered the U.S. Navy in 1977 and retired 20 years later in 1997 from the military. He and his C-130 crew encountered high strangeness in Antarctica from 1995 to 1996 several times. They all saw rapidly moving silver disks over the trans-Antarctic mountains. Brian and his crew also saw a huge football field-sized hole in the ice only about 5 to 10 miles from the geographic South Pole that was supposed to be a no-fly zone. But during an emergency medevac crisis to speed up their trip, they flew across that no-fly zone and saw apparently what they were not supposed to see, a huge hole in the ice that looked like it was an entrance to an underground installation. Later at camp near Marie Birdland, some dozen scientists disappeared for two weeks. When they reappeared, Brian's Brian's flight crew was assigned to pick them up, and all were silent and appeared scared. Brian and his C-130 crew received orders to not talk about the silver disks or the huge ice hole, or the missing scared scientists. Repeatedly, the crew was sternly told that they did not see what they kept seeing, but Brian was never asked to sign an official non-disclosure agreement. So now that he's retired from the Navy while still working in civilian aerospace, Brian wanted to share what he has seen and experienced with me at Earth Files because he is convinced that an alien presence is living and working on this planet. We had never met until Thursday evening, June 2nd, 2016, at the Contact in the Desert Conference in Joshua Tree, California. We organized to meet with his nephew, Kelly, and a friend to talk about Brian's Antarctic experiences. We all went to a local Mexican restaurant, and after dinner, We kept talking until after midnight outside in the restaurant parking lot under trees. That weekend, while I was still doing lectures, workshops, and panels at the contact conference, Brian returned to his home in Phoenix, Arizona. On Monday, June 6th, he was back at his aerospace job, which he has always kept confidential. I don't have a number there to call him because he wants to keep his job protected. But that morning, Brian received a surprising and disturbing phone call that he describes now. The voice on the other end of the... I was back at work on Monday after the conference, and my cell phone rang about 10.30, quarter to 11 in the morning, and the voice...
footage that Brian is referring to was first reported in a March 18, 2002 press release from the Atlantis Mapping Project in Washington, D.C. that began, quote, the U.S. government said it will seek to block the airing of a video found by Navy rescuers in Antarctica that purportedly reveals that a massive archaeological dig is underway two miles beneath the ice, close quote. The video was allegedly the property of a Beverly Hills company called Atlantis TV that produced the Atlantis Mapping Project channel for the BBC in London until 2015 when it was closed down. The March 2002 release also said that the Atlantis TV crew had disappeared and that two U.S. Navy officers had found the missing production crew's videotape, quote, in an abandoned supply dump 100 miles west of Vostok Station, close quote. That would be near the South Pole. The AMP press release said the video shown to National Science Foundation researchers at the South Pole's Amundsen Scott Station showed a pyramid and, quote, other spectacular ruins and things they could not go into, close quote. Allegedly, Navy SEALs came in one or more helicopters to take objects away. Officials of the U.S. Naval Support Task Force in Antarctica denied the story and said the Navy did not possess any video shot by the missing Atlantis TV crew. But at the same time, there was another U.S. legal action in 2002 to block the release of a hardcover book entitled Raising Atlantis by Tom Greenius, a novel based on fact. The book is about a secret U.S. military expedition that discovers ancient ruins two miles beneath the ice in Antarctica. The government allowed the first e-book version in the spring to be released with sensitive information about U.S. underground continuity of government installations, but blocked the hardcover release until the sensitive information was deleted. Could that big ice hole that Brian and his C-130 Navy crew saw near the South Pole in 1995 and the later incident in early 1996 of the missing National Science Foundation scientists be linked to the 2002 Atlantis Mapping Project news release about the missing documentary crew and videotape of pyramids and other structures beneath the ice? If the U.S. government is trying to cover up the discovery of pyramid and other structures two miles below the ice near the South Pole in Antarctica, the secret would be revolutionary because the last time the entire Antarctica continent was free of ice is generally considered to be about 15 million years ago. So any advanced architecture on land beneath the ice would be that old as well.
Brian, what can anyone do to an agency that calls up from anonymous voices who do not even identify themselves by name or agency they are calling from and then try deliberately to intimidate? I don't know what we can do. If the government says it's not going to happen or shut up, that's what happens. I think people just have to come forward and tell what they know. It's like one person stands up in a crowd and says, no, I'm not going to do it. And you know what? Somewhere in that crowd, there are other people that feel the exact same way. And if one more person stands up and one more person stands up, pretty soon you've got a crowd and we need to get back into that kind of mindset and make the government serve us and not us serve the government. Brian, would you please read the email that you sent to me? Okay. Linda, I was listening to your reporting, Bill Tompkins, and his knowledge about the alien races and the agendas they are attempting to carry out. I started to realize the things that my father had told me in his ending years of life that now made total sense to me. His account of the times during World War II flying bombing missions over Germany, the balls of light, which he called Foo Fighters, his two missions that he thought he and his crew were not going to make it back from Germany, because his plane had been shut up so badly, flying only on two engines. And when he thought that everything was lost, he told me that he turned to his co-pilot, and there sitting between them was the image of Christ. He told me that Christ put his hand over his hand on the throttles of his B-17 and pushed him up to full power. This next thing my dad then said is what he was engulfed in a white light so bright could not see anything in the cockpit of his bomber. And then the next instant, his plane was over the English Channel, and he had lost several hours of time. As my dad was telling me about this mission, he was upset and crying. I had never seen my dad ever cry before in my life. Until the day my dad died, he would not say any more about that mission. He would tell me about his other missions flying over Germany as many times as I wanted to hear them. That one, only once, did he talk about. That mission, I believe, was one of the Foo Fighter encounters he had, and his crew may have been abducted and then returned to the aircraft just before the plane reached England. Our family lineage is Nordic and Norwegian and goes back to the Viking clans. My dad's side of the family are all blue-eyed blondes, and my mom's side is German descent. Well, your guest, Bill Tompkins, was telling me about Nordic reptilian connection and some of the Nordic-type alien species has me wondering if my family is involved with that somehow. My dad also talked about his dreams of what he called reptile men during his time flying missions over Germany. He would laugh that off and say that he probably read too many comic books as a kid, but I think it scared him, and he had encounters also with the reptilians during one or more of his flights over Germany. I think all this means something, and hearing Bill Tompkins has triggered a better understanding of things that have happened. Bill Tompkins, who Brian is referencing, is now a 93-year-old retired aerospace engineer and author of a recent book entitled Selected by Extraterrestrials, My Life in the Top Secret World of UFOs, Think Tanks, and Nordic Secretaries. Mr. Tompkins' extraordinary life included flying all over the United States in the 1940s to secret sites at Lockheed, Northrop, Douglas, and other aerospace companies and top universities that were doing secret work for the United States Navy. In May 2016, I did an interview with him for my news website, earthfiles.com. Bill Tompkins told me as a young man in early 1942, he was inducted into the U.S. Navy where he was asked to make scale models from photographs of extraterrestrial aerial craft. The various corporate Navy contractors had learned about through government intelligence operatives that included Nazi SS manufacturing of anti-gravity spacecraft. Tompkins also learned that behind Adolf Hitler in the Second World War, there were two different species of reptilian humanoids. One included what he called Dracos from the Draco constellation, about 12 light years from Earth, and known as a satellite of our own Milky Way galaxy. 
According to Bill Tompkins, Navy intelligence learned that humanoid reptilians from the Draco constellation were manipulating Hitler to annihilate the Hebrews on Earth and populate the whole planet with blonde, blue-eyed Nordics that were another type of extraterrestrial under the control of the Draco reptilians. Bill Tompkins and his naval superiors were very confused by the idea that hostile reptiles and beautiful blonde humanoids were working together to take over planet Earth. Adding to their confusion were other beautiful Nordic humanoids that helped the Allies to defeat Hitler. That complex and insidious chess game haunted everyone then and still does today. Nordic blood and blonde-haired U.S. Navy flight engineer Brian and his father who saw Christ in the crashing jet in World War II, they are definitely good guys. But Whitley, who, what, and why are there blonde and reptilian humanoids that want to destroy Hebrew bloodlines and perhaps all of Homo sapiens sapiens? You talk about a difficult question. That, I think, qualifies as a difficult question. You know, I've had in my life experience with the blonde people, a couple of big experiences with them. One was a long telephone call with one of them who was, at the time of the call, uh, in a uh, uh, the home of a United States Defense Department physicist. What? Ja, hold on, Linda. We decided not to edit this interruption out of the show for reasons that will become obvious in just a moment. I refer in it to my Awakening series and the material in Awakenings 18, 19, and 20 relate to what Anne was telling me during this episode. And now let's get back to my discussion with Linda about what was happening. Linda, just let me go back. You know what just happened? Well, it sounds like a computer or something just popped up. Yeah, what happened was this. My phone is on silent. And suddenly Siri turned on and asked me if I wanted to call Anne's hospital. Oh, my God. It's sitting here totally untouched. God, do you think Anne is there? Well, all through the interview, I've been feeling Anne's presence really strongly and, and, and getting a lot of, actually, of information from her about very deep soul work that doesn't seem superficially to have to do with the interview, but it's certainly going to be in my Awakening series that I've been doing on Unknown Country but let's now look again. We were just talking about these blonde beings, and I was talking about the ones I had interacted with, who were obviously n- not the bad guys. The, I've mentioned before on this show that the one I had the telephone conversation with was very wary of the greys, saying that if we started a war with them, they would never let us quit fighting, and they would never let us win, mm-hmm. which struck me as very like them in terms of personality as I understand it. I wouldn't be surprised if that would be exactly what they would do. Um, but there was another time when these two enormous blonde people showed up in my apartment in Manhattan, and who, which had rather low ceilings, much to their discomfort, and uh, I blurted out I, that I, uh, when they asked me how they could, what they could do for me, I, I said you could show me one of your children, which I've always regretted. And uh, yet they did a few weeks later in an airport in uh, uh, Colorado, in Stapleton, the old Stapleton Airport in Denver. And I've spoken about this many times, so all I will say is that Under the circumstances, they showed me one of their children, and with the child was the scientist from Boulder, from the foothills above Boulder, and a 
heavily disguised gray, about five feet tall, who appeared to be taking care of the gigantic six-year-old. It was a very, very strange sight. And it, in fact, they gathered a crowd when the gray and the, and the giant little boy started playing patty cakes so fast you couldn't see their hands. Well, but there is this other facet that Bill Tompkins and others bring to all this. Yes. Bill Tompkins was this naval flight engineer who worked for our government in the Navy as a young man because he had this idiot savant ability to make absolutely accurate scale models from photographs and seeing real things. And so our government put him to work in a Navy program to look at photographs of different craft and make these scale models and in the process. He learns about Dracos and Blondes, and one of the most, I think, eerie and has haunted me statements that he made was his learning that our government understood that the reptilians could create Nordic-looking, beautiful containers in order to inhabit as they infiltrated our population on our Earth and other planets that the Draco reptilians want territory, they want to control territory, and they will do it in any way that involves camouflage, holograms, projecting into uh, cloned or hybridized bodies that they make. On the other side, he said they began to understand that there were also blonde Nordics that are human allies. They want us to survive, and that the very fact that something seemingly as overbearing, overwhelming, and scary as these tall humanoid reptiles could project themselves into something that would appear to humans as beautiful blondes, while there were true other blondes that are our allies, makes this the most insidious situation, and that it is depressing. It became depressing to Bill Tompkins and others. How do humans? understand which side, the friendlies, the unfriendlies, that we're dealing with, if all of them can camouflage each other in their enemy or their ally, and we humans haven't got a clue. Linda, you know, I just, I almost don't know how to, um, how to respond to this, because we have a, a situation here that is, it's really kind of untenable in the sense that we know something very strange is happening. People like Brian coming forward, I mean, let's face it, he saw something, wouldn't be out doing this. Yeah. But what really happened? Is it like this in, out there, or is it is something else true? And is it even from out there? I mean, you know, we just don't even know that. Well, Bill Tompkins also adds this uh, huge, I think, insight that in World War II, Adolf Hitler had this obsession about Argentina and uh, Antarctica. Yes. As well, and that Bill Tompkins says on the record, my gosh, he's working with Bob Wood, who worked for McDonnell Douglas, and Bob Wood has been helping uh, Bill Tompkins edit his uh, memoirs into autobiographies. And you can trust Bob Wood, and he's working with Bill Tompkins, and Bill Tompkins said that our government learned that there were three very large, what, to use the word cavern, doesn't do it justice. He said they are natural large spaces in the Antarctica land base. I'm not talking about in the ice. I'm talking about under the land of Antarctica, and that non-humans have been using and inhabiting these large caverns in the Antarctic continent for millions of years. They are the alien presence that, uh, when you go back to JFK and all of the whistleblowers that have come forward, like uh, uh, Caddy, who was the attorney who got the uh, Watergate uh, burglars out, and he did a long interview with Daniel List, the dark journalist, and he and I worked together and shared that Gaddy was saying uh, that E. Howard Hunt, before he died, had told Gaddy that the reason JFK was assassinated by the CIA was because he had become a national security threat 
because he was insisting on all the information about the, quote, alien presence, close quote, on Earth. That means it is here, it is underground, but it is also out there in the solar system and in the Milky Way and beyond. And And you have to think that if, if this... There's this problem of releasing information, then whoever is hiding is going to be extremely upset if it's released. In other words, somebody does not want that to happen. And that would be because whatever they're doing, they want to be left alone by the human population. They want us to not respond to their presence but it's so clear from bill Tompkins and even john brandenburg now who is uh presenting scientific papers about the two atomic explosions on mars yes we've had him on dreamland he's fabulous and that there has been secret uh, well from earth's point of view secret there have been all kinds of wars raging through this solar system throughout the milky way galaxy and as bill Tompkins said not only are there warring factions in the Milky Way galaxy, it goes way beyond into other galaxies, and that on this planet right now, as we are living and speaking, our government has secret galactic trade routes having to do with technologies and who knows what else that are going, with, going on with quote-unquote friendlies that are depositing things here on the Earth, getting technology from human engineers that they like, and that we are going forward into the 21st century as a planet that has been kept ignorant and dark, while there are percentages of the human population that are collaborating with, trading with other intelligences in this galaxy and beyond. And that is what Bill Tompkins, Corey Good. Anthony Sanchez, a list is growing now that their whistleblowers have insisted this is the truth. This is the reality, and this is also what Tom DeLong, who is now allegedly working with 10 government insiders and put out that book, Secret Machines, to be followed by more about the extraterrestrial presence on Earth, past, present, and future, and that what he is now trying to do is to work with government insiders with their approval and permission to say the Greeks were never gods, the Anunnaki were never gods, Lemuria Mu, these were all extraterrestrial civilizations inhabiting Earth for periods of time. The question that is not clear, why did they leave, where are they now, and who will come back? Well, you know, I have a message here from Anne. As Anne is very present in this conversation, and surprisingly to me, because this wasn't the sort of thing that she really focused on when we were still both in the physical, but here it is. She's saying, when people fail to keep their place, she means planet, then others we'll take it. Mm -hmm. It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And you know, what we're looking at here is a species, the human species, that is in the process of losing control of its planet, uh, of its planet, its environment, and we are going to be in big trouble as a result of this. This has been the consistent message, not only in my experience with the visitors, primarily with the greys, but with most every close encounter witness I know who's into this in some coherent way and not in the demons, angels space or something like that. Uh, that is that the planet's in trouble and we need to act on our own behalf. Interestingly enough, the, the greys don't have the attitude that it's our fault. They feel it's the fault of our structure. In other words, we have no, and I learned this when I was a child in the secret school, we have no season, sexual seasonality, we have no hair, and we have very prominent genitals and excellent memories, and this has made us sexually overactive. And the result has been a population explosion that we is not our fault, it's the fault of our 
of our uh, evolutionary structure, but we're still in jeopardy because of it. Because if we lose the planet, then it's up for grabs. Somebody else can take it and do what they can to fix it and make use of it. And that fits into what John Brandenburg says, that this is a neutral zone or has been a neutral zone in terms of geopolitical territorial conflicts, that there are various types of non-human intelligences that come and go, and Earth is both a laboratory and a trade route market, and that there are interests out there that have been trying to undermine humanity so that we would become so weak that they can take the planet Earth and that whatever happened on Mars, whatever was the reason behind that war, that whoever exploded these hydrogen bombs in the air to make the percussion on the ground even more destructive to what John Brandenburg thinks were two uh, Sidonia area of cities that may have had two million beings in them, all of it devastated with the two hydrogen bomb explosions. We need to find out who was responsible for the hydrogen bombs I think John thinks it is the uh, the nasty category of greys who were chasing after tall pails that have been described by others in books now that there has been a war going on between tall pails and a certain faction of greys for millennia and that in Mars there was this war that was had an ancient motive but now it has affected our entire solar system without Earth humans understanding, and he said the most interesting thing to me recently, Whitley, John said the reason for the push, this clear push from NASA and JPL to get back to Mars, we need to have verification, we need to have a reality check as homo sapien sapien on what we have been told by Ebens, Greys, Nordics, or whoever, and that what essentially John thinks will happen. It will be a return to Mars. It will be disguised as exploring, getting out into our solar system, when in fact it will be an archaeological expedition to a dead planet that was killed by two hydrogen bomb explosions in the air. Two truly massive explosions, if John is right. Uh we had on the show on June the 15th, uh, the, the, uh, uh, let's see, I guess it was, must have been, uh, Nick Redfern was with us with his book, Weapons of the Gods. And he was talking about areas in, uh, the Middle East that are glazed with Trinitite. Just like on Mars. Exactly. Now, I want to now go from there to a letter I received many years ago from a lady who lived in Tennessee and had been out walking with her son in uh, in the woods when suddenly this little dark blue figure and these kobolds, as I call them, are, are in, heavily involved with me right now. In I'm having a period of time where I've, I don't think I've ever been more involved with them than I am in these past six months. In any case, that aside, it came and he said, I'm a rebel and I'm here to tell you the truth. There was a war between Earth and Mars many, many, many years ago. Earth destroyed the surface of Mars, but we captured your souls and have condemned you to recycle on your planet Forever. We call it dead forever. And that was it. It stepped back into the cave it had come out of and was gone. Now, flash forward to another event that took place in Indonesia. And folks, you can find this also because I interviewed the gentleman who was involved in this on Dreamland as well. And I'm working toward his name. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll remember it. And if I, I'll go back and edit it in here if I can't remember it right away. In any case, he was going to a village in Indonesia, 
and had been told he was an, an NGO, a non-governmental organization operative, setting up low-power, localized radio stations so very isolated tribes could communicate among themselves. And he was going to this very isolated area. And in the context of this experience, he found out about a number of people who Alan Lammers was his name, L-A-M-E-R-S. Go to unknowncountry.com, go to Dreamland, uh, I mean, go to the search engine, the uh, extended search engine, click on Dreamland and put in L-A-M-E-R-S and you'll find the interview if you're a subscriber. In any case, a group of five people had disappeared and only one of them came back. Ever. He's, the other four were never been found. And he described walking through an area that ceased to be the jungle and became a kind of forested upland with antlered animals in it, which, of course, uh, they don't have in Indonesia. And they were followed, he said, by these dark blue figure, this dark blue figure who said that he was a rebel and this man, this one man, was being sent back as a warning to the world. Now, I put all of that out without really putting it together, mm -hmm. but it's linked. It's linked. There is somebody here trying in a kind of off-kilter way to somehow warn us about something. And there seem to be other forces less visible to us, more indirectly present, that are about the dangers that we are being warned of. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that makes any sense to anybody. It I does, hope it does. It does, because I have reported before about the Army sergeant in Colorado that I call CJ, who on July 29th, leaving Hunter Air, Army Airfield to go to uh, Fort Carson in Colorado, and he, his wife, two kids, and animals and all uh, were headed to go through Atlanta, and something took over, diverted, the GPS did not make any alarm, and they end up uh, being having an 850-foot diameter disc with symbols on it come down in front of their truck. And he works in the Army in a role where his job is to see anything on the ground, in the air, and be able to analyze, estimate sizes, distances, and what they are. That's what he does for a living. And he knew that he was looking at something that was approximately 820 to 25 feet in diameter in front of the road. And then how it all unfolds, I have all of this at earthfiles.com, one of the most extraordinary missing time and evolving stories involving a military person that I've ever investigated. And when he comes, uh, finally, when the whole family realizes they're on the wrong road, they're going the wrong direction, they had no clue from the GPS, he is completely astonished and confused. They get back in the road that will take them to Atlanta. They finally get to a motel and check in, exhausted. But he finds himself opening his eyes, standing, leaning against the door jamb of the bathroom in the motel. In his one hand, he has a ballpoint pen. and the other hand, he has an 8.5 by 11 receipt from the motel when they checked in. And he is looking at the back of his receipt, and there is a string of squares and ones. And I have been working with uh, uh, Horace Drew, the geneticist in Sydney, in translating what appears to be binary code, even in layers. It's very complex. All of it, everything that has been transpiring and continuing to come periodically into his mind in sleep ever since a year ago has to do with these same words 
that appeared in Penniston, that has appeared in crop formations, and has appeared in other binary-related translations. Humanity must advance in order to survive. Life is not guaranteed here that we have allies, but there are enemies out there that want us gone. This is what this army sergeant has been receiving for a year. Well, you know, I often think either we're an incident in some vast, I don't even know if you can call it a conflict, in some vast uh, uh, disturbance that is that is sweeping around us, or we are the focus of a battle, literally between dark and light, and or both. Right. And I, you know, I have to say that I think it's very holographic. I think that what is happening to us reflects a fundamental condition of the universe. That is to say, this conflict that we see as a conflict is also the endless uh, friction between dark and light. You know, Ann and I and Shirley McLean used to go to a restaurant up on um, the Pacific Coast Highway called Jeffrey's. It was a, it's a lovely place, and you can sit outside and have a lovely dinner overlooking the Pacific. It's just beautiful. And the sun sets and it gets dark. And we would sit out there and talk together for hours. And Shirley felt strongly that there was a great darkness that hated the light and had been at peace within itself before the light that is our universe appeared and wanted it gone. And Annie was always the one on the side of the light and listening to them. I mean, not that Shirley wasn't either, but I mean, they were talking about it. In other words, Annie talked about what the light wanted and Shirley what the dark wanted. I'm not saying that Shirley was on the dark side and Anne was on the light side at all. But their discussions were so large scale that when I go back in my mind to them and I listen to us talking, it is really like we are talking about the same thing but on a much smaller scale. Right. And I think that we're not necessarily talking about a war such as so much as a fundamental condition of reality. And Whitley? According to Bohm and other physicists, it was Bohm who was so eloquent, said, all mass is frozen light. And now we have a Harvard physicist who is saying that there are positive photons, and those photons in Bell's theorem have been proved to be entangled, connected, linked over a 13.9 billion light-year universe and yet dark matter and dark energy is the biggest mystery. And now at uh, Harvard University, physicist Randall is talking about and writing about dark photons. And I could not help but in recently reading about her research that if there are dark photons and there are light photons, what is the relationship And could we be in a universe in which the very fabric of our puzzlement over dark matter and energy versus the entanglement of bright, white, pure photons be the essence of a struggle here that is macro and micro? Well, exactly. It is. And, you know, and it's holographic in the sense that every tiny piece of it reflects the whole vast truth of it. Like the yin and yang symbol. Right, exactly, like the yin and yang symbol, which is feminine and masculine, active, passive, good, bad, uh, positive, negative, peaceful, warlike, dangerous, safe. 
But you can look at it objectively if you go back to active and passive. And the active side is the light. The passive side is the dark wanting the light to leave. But there's yet another way of looking at it as a journey. We are journeying now through the dark side and absorbing all kinds of different energy. Everything our journey through time and darkness throws at us, we absorb. And when we die, we come out into the light side and engage in that life review where we drop away things that we don't need and uh, 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 memorialize things that we do in our souls somehow and gain energy from it. But the dark side always seeks to extinguish the light, and the light always seeks to survive. I'm with the light. I'm with both. I'm with both. I want to use the dark to learn and to gain energy. But I want to be in the light <laughs> in the end for sure. You know, uh, as I often say about the visitor experience, you know, I want to go for it, but I want to cut the cards myself. And that's how I feel about the dark. Uh, my heart and soul belong to the light. My whole being belongs to the light and can never be changed. Meaning that, of course, like you or any of us who are like that, we are always a danger to the dark side and always visible to it. We cannot hide. That's one of the problems of being out here on the edge where we are. I don't want to hide. I want the truth. <laughs> I don't think you want to hide, Linda. That, 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 that's not your modus operandi at all, or mine. I want this whole planet to finally know truth. You know... It would be nice, in there is this possibility always that we will come to a time of reconciliation and peace. We're going to go through a terrific upheaval, period. Whether what form it will take, I don't know, but it's going to happen. And when it happens and after it happens, that's the important part, because if we come to a new state of acceptance of the ambiguities of being human and reconciliation with one another, then afterwards can be a time of peace. And peace is always a time of inner discovery. You can search yourself and the world around you much more easily in peace than you can in war. We've been at war, and, and we have been an incident in a greater war for a very long time. It would be nice to become, for a while at least, an incident in a greater peace. Linda Moulton Howe, thank you so much for being with us on Dreamland. It's, as always, been quite an experience. And Ann Streber, thank you for coming in with that remarkable and extremely enlightening comment. Yes, thank you.